Welcome, everyone, to the Rosie and Bill Show. Our guest this week is a true music icon. His songs have more than just transcended generations. They've been recorded and covered as hits by generations of artists. Please welcome to the Rosie and Bill Show a man with nine platinum albums, 23 gold singles, and more than 100 million albums sold worldwide, Tommy James. Tommy, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you. It's great to be with you. Well, it's so nice to see you again, Tommy. We had seen you perform that night at the American Music Theater in Lancaster uh, a couple months ago, and that was such a treat. You sound as good or better than ever. So, well, thank if, you so much. I remember that show. Yes, we, I we remember had a you, time. and uh, it's good to see you again. Thank you so much. And we're glad you're feeling better. So. Thank you. That's a good thing. I've had a bit of a cold. So anyway, uh, my voice is uh, shaping up a little bit now. Wonderful. Well, Tommy, we're going to take it back a little bit. Back in the early days in Niles, Michigan. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what was the inspiration for you to get into the music business and to start you're playing music. And also, who were your influences back then? Well, uh, they used, my mother used to tell me that the only way she could get, when I was an infant, the only way she could get me to stop crying was to turn on the radio. And as soon as I heard music, um, I would stop crying. And uh, that's kind of been with me my whole life. If you want to get me to stop crying, just play some music. Um, <laughs> And seriously, I have been involved with music as long as I can remember. When I was uh, four years old, uh, uh, on my birthday, my grandfather bought me a ukulele. And uh, honestly, I started strumming it and working with it. And I learned songs that were on the radio. And um, uh, I, I, all my life, I have just been in love with music and wanted to play music. When I was nine years old, I uh, got my first guitar, an acoustic guitar, when I saw Elvis on uh, the Ed Sullivan show. The ukulele went out the window, and I wanted a guitar. God bless my mom. I begged her, and she got it for me. And uh, it was a Stella guitar, one of the cheapest you can buy, but it, but it was my guitar. And uh, the following year, I got my first electric guitar when I was 10 and I uh, learned everything I could learn on the radio and bought records and uh, learned how to play. And uh, when I was 12 years old, we moved to Niles, Michigan. And uh, uh, that's what I consider my hometown to be. And when we were in Niles, Michigan, um, I started my first band in junior high school in seventh grade. And we started with two guitars and drums and uh, I started playing around uh, the American Legion Hall, the Elks Club, any place that would have us. We called ourselves the Tornadoes. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we developed a little bit of a following. I got a job in the local record shop when I was 14. Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. We appreciate each and every one of you. And we also appreciate our first and longest running sponsor of the show, Tom and his team of insurance professionals at the Malin Agency. If world-class customer service and doing business with someone you can trust is important to you, give Tom and his team a call today for all your insurance needs. I could promote my band out of the record shop in addition to selling records. And I, uh, one of the local distributors uh, had a record shop with a recording studio in the back. And he actually put records out on a little label called Northway Sound and uh, asked me if I'd like to come up with my group and, uh, and record. And I said, absolutely, let's go right now. And so I had my first record out when I was 14. It was called uh, Long Ponytail, and we sold it in a record shop and uh, did okay with it. And uh, when I, when I, we, meanwhile, I was, we were playing 
you know, local clubs or local uh, halls or wherever they'd have us. And um, when I was 16, I made uh, a, a deal with another fellow who had a record company, a DJ, who had a little label called Snap Records. And we recorded four songs for him. And one of them ended up being my first hit, Hanky <laughs> Panky. So, I mean, that's an involved story. I won't, I won't bore you with all that. But the bottom line was that um, we put it out locally. It did okay, but it kind of came and went. And so the record kind of got put on a shelf. And when I was, uh, when I, I graduated from high school then in 1965, when I was 18, and I took my band on the road. We had long forgot about Hanky Panky. And... Uh, in early 1966, I'm playing this dumpy little club in Janesville, Wisconsin. And right in the middle of my two weeks, uh, the club got shut down by the IRS because the club owner didn't pay his taxes. <laughs> so we were let go and go went home back to Niles, Michigan, feeling like dogs. And um, uh, But that's how God works. Uh, as soon as I got home... I got the telephone call that changed my life. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems that uh, in Pittsburgh, of all places, uh, this two and a half year old record of Hanky Panky uh, ended up in a record bin and was pulled out uh, as an old as an oldie and played on the radio, and the thing exploded and. Quite literally, uh, they sold 80,000, they bootlegged it and sold 80,000 records in 10 days. And when they called me on the phone, we were sitting at number one in the city of Pittsburgh, only in the city of Pittsburgh. And that began my career. I didn't believe it at first. You know, I said, who is this? And <laughs> it convinced me that who they were, that was the local distributorship and asked me if I would come to Pittsburgh and do some TV and some radio and, uh, you know, a couple of little gigs. Well, I had a real hard time putting the band back together. Uh, uh, I really couldn't do it. It had made Hanky Panky. So I went to Pittsburgh with the uh, original record producer, uh, Jack Douglas, who was a disc jockey there locally. And we went to Pittsburgh and sure enough, Outside of Pittsburgh, I'm nobody. But as soon as we cross the city limits, uh, I have the number one record. And so I, I put a new group together from Pittsburgh. As By that time, by the way, when we recorded Pittsburgh, I recorded Hanky Panky. Uh, we changed our name to the Shondells. And so uh, it was on the bootleg record as the Shondells. So I put a new group of Shondells together from Pittsburgh. And a week later, we're in New York selling the master to a major label. And um, I don't know how far you want. This is a very long-winded well, story. You know I'm what? sorry to bore you with it, but You're no, not Tommy, this is, this is that's how it happened. Music history. Tommy, yeah, this is literally like Rosie said, Tommy. This is music history, and you actually you're you're going into what was going to be one of my next questions because what I found fascinating about when you went to New York was you met with, if I understand correctly, you met with a lot of the record companies and then all of a sudden you start getting all these polite, no thanks, no thanks, That's no right. thanks. When I went to New York um, uh, with the fellow who became my first manager, um, we literally went to uh, the major labels. We got a yes, because uh, Pittsburgh was a, uh, was a major market. And... Um, uh, so they were all aware of the record when I got there. I, we got a yes from CBS, got a yes from Epic, got a yes from Atlantic, RCA, uh, Kama Sutra. You remember Kama Sutra records? Um, and the last place we took the record to was Roulette. Mm. Uh, you know, Roulette was a, a, a good little label. It had a bunch of hits, but... It wasn't one. It wasn't a major corporate label like Columbia or RCA. So I went to bed that night. We we slept at the City Square Hotel in Manhattan, 
And I went to bed that night feeling really good that we were probably going to be with one of the majors, you know, Atlantic or Epic or Columbia. And uh, uh, the next morning, about uh, 9.30 or 10 o'clock, we start getting calls from all the labels that had said yes the day before, uh, saying, listen, uh, Tom, we got to pass. I'm sorry. And I said, what, what the hell's going on? I thought we had a deal. <laughs> Finally, Jerry Wexler up at Atlantic told me the truth, that Morris Levy, the head of Roulette Records, had called all the other labels and, and backed them down, scared the hell out of them. He called, he, he, he was... He was every bit a, a, a mobster and a thug. We didn't know that. And uh, called all the labels and he said, you know, in his, in his uh, mobbed up voice, he says, this is my record. Back off. And they did. Every one of them. <laughs> and so we were apparently going to be on roulette records. And uh, that's how it happened. Whether you liked it or not. <laughs> ended up with roulette. And of course, they took Hanky Panky to number one in the nation and number one all over the world. And it turned out to be uh, one of the three biggest records of the summer of 66. And uh, so, I mean, and of course, we ended up with uh, 23 gold singles and 100 million albums uh, being sold worldwide over my career with Roulette. So, um, you know, at that level, it seemed to have been the perfect decision. A lot of other stuff went down, too, that we can talk about. But well, uh, well, I that's how it happened for me. For a second, when you heard the why behind the nose, how much trepidation did you have to sign? Well, I had some, no doubt about it. And uh, even more, when I went up to meet Morris Levy, uh, who hadn't been there the day before. And I went up and meeting, you know, Morris Levy was right out of the movies. I mean, the way he talked, you know, he was about 6'3". He was 250 pounds. He shook his hand. It was like grabbing hold of a catcher's mitt. I mean, he was a big, tough guy. And uh, everything about him was this character and uh, uh, so I, on one hand, I was fascinated by him. And the other hand, I was afraid of him. Sure. Um, and uh, the bottom line was that he was exactly what he appeared to be. And um, I had to get used to that. Um, there was no denying it that Morris Levy was very intimidating. You know, at a creative level, it was a wonderful place to be because I got uh, the run of the place. Uh, you know, I, I, I got everything roulette could give uh, because they needed a hit right then. They hadn't had a hit uh, in like three years. I think the last hit they had before Hanky Panky was the Essex, easier said than done. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And uh, so they needed a hit record. And, and we were it. So um, they gave me everything they had, which was a lot uh, at a creative level. Getting paid was another story. <laughs> another story. Crime doesn't pay, you know. Um, <laughs> but, but at any rate, um, uh, they allowed me things that would have never happened at Columbia. If I had gone with Columbia or, or RCA or one of the majors, I can tell you right now, we would have been lucky to be a one-hit wonder, especially with a record like Hanky Panky. Um, you know, we would have been, the competition would have been awful, uh, and we would have immediately been turned over to an A&R man, you know, an in-house producer, and that's probably the last time anybody would have ever heard from us. But at Roulette, they needed us, and they allowed me to put my own crew together. They allowed me to really take control of my own career mm -hmm. and uh, at a recording level. And I, was, I brought in writers and producers from other places, uh, Richie Cordell and Bo Gentry, 
became my producers. They were, I brought them over from Kama Sutra. But I, I realized I had to learn everything fast because if I was going to be in charge of this, I had to learn things that I had never known before about the, you know, but, but at roulette, I got to learn my craft. I got to learn uh, the record business at a street level. Uh, I got to learn, you know, the promotion men, the distributors. Uh, it was like the record shop was my first venture into the record business. Uh, mm -hmm. It was it was grade school and this was college. Mm -hmm. And so uh, at any rate, uh, I, I really got to learn every aspect of the music business and pretty much take control of my own career. Thank God. Well, Tommy, you just mentioned two of your co-writers. So I'm going to I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I know that you wrote Moni Moni with those gentlemen. And yeah. I would love to have been a fly on the wall. What was the inspiration, if you can share that story with our audience, uh, to write that song? Well, believe it or not, we had the music track before we had the song. We went into the studio. I, I uh, went into uh, the studio with two of my favorite musicians, Pete Lucia, our drummer, and uh, uh, Jonathan Ash, the, uh, the played bass, he was sort of the substitute when one of the members of the Shondells couldn't show up and one night, and they couldn't. So I brought in Pete and John, and we just started playing around with an old three chord kind of party rock thing. We didn't realize what we were doing, really. We just wanted, I wanted to put one of those old, um, <clears throat> I don't know, Gary U.S. Bonds, Mitch Ryder kind of old time, uh, uh, you know, party rock records that put everybody on the dance floor. And it was 1968 and not many people were doing party rock anymore. Um, you know, everybody was too stoned to dance. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I was taking a chance. But this was, uh, I'd had several hits up to that point. So we really, uh, I really had the freedom to do this kind of stuff. So we got in the studio and we just laid down this three chord thing. And um, uh, it sounded good. It sounded like old time rock and roll. And we just kept going until we had an entire track uh, with the three of us. And so... Uh, we had no title and no song, so we quickly wrote a song, you know, a lot of silly words, a lot of nonsensical stuff, and uh, we got to the point where it was the night before I was supposed to do the lead vocal, and we still had no title, and so, uh, you know, Richie is up, uh, Richie Cordell uh, and I are in my living room in Midtown Manhattan, and we're trying to come up with a title and we're looking for like a two syllable girl's name, a, a kind of silly girl's name, like a Sloopy or a Boney Maroney, that type of thing. And we couldn't, everything sounded so dumb. So we threw our guitars down. We go out on the terrace, light up a cigarette. And the first thing our eyes fall on is the Mutual of New York <laughs> Insurance Company. <laughs> M O N Y with the in the middle of the O. It had a dollar sign with the gave you the time and the weather. And we're just looking at this thing and we both crack up because that's the perfect name. That's the name we're looking for. Yeah. It's like God just said, Here's the title. Right. And so we we just realized that was perfect. And that became the title. And uh we already had the words to the song, but we just filled in the blanks with the title. So at any rate, that's literally how it happened. When you recorded it and you listened back to it, did you have an inkling that this was going to be an iconic song? I must say yes, because I didn't know it was going to be an iconic song, but we felt that it was going to be a hit. And we listened to it and, and just, you couldn't sit still and listen to it. 
You know, it just, it made you move. And uh, we brought in, I brought in people off the street. I mean, I, I, we had secretaries from the building. It was the 1650 uh, Broadway building uh, at, in the basement where Allegro Studios were. And we brought in, you know, uh, people from who were getting off work and brought them into the studio and, and uh, uh, people off the street. We must have had 30 people in the uh, in the studio screaming and singing background and just going nuts it was a party that got captured on tape that's really what happened so uh we were very happy with it because it just was so big and sloppy and just what it had to be you know what i'm saying to be believable yeah, and tommy you also had uh, a music video for that song like long before mtv right yeah, I was in my Nehru jacket and my beads. <laughs> and uh, I get asked a lot, what did you do with the, the beads? And I said, I think I smoked them. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, the bottom line was we did a video uh, in 60, thir 13 years before MTV. Mm -hmm. And it made perfect sense to me to make a film of your hit record mm. made all the sense in the world. You could do the, but we couldn't get any American TV stations to play it. They were not going to be told what to do. We're not playing rock and roll on, you know, the only place we could get Moni Moni fit the Moni Moni video played was in European movie theaters. I swear to God in between the double features. And so it was me and Daffy duck for a long time. And Daffy always wanted to close, really upset. You, you know, you, you think you know a duck, and then he pulls <laughs> out something. Anyway, um, that's, that's really the truth. And uh, uh, that was the only place we could get it played. Years later, when MTV came along uh, and VH1, they started playing uh, the old video of Moaning Moaning, and it was kind of funny. Yeah. Well, Tommy, I want to just first of all, compliment you because I watched that video and I know Bill did too. Your voice is so clear, so powerful, and you make it seem so easy. Well, thank you very much. And, um, and, and it's just perfect for that song. My only follow-up question to all of this is when the song was covered by Billy Idol, it kind of took a turn. People started chiming in with some some chants. Some dirty that, words, yeah, right? Did that surprise you? How did it sit with you? Well, the first the first time I heard it, they 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 did it to me. I hadn't heard Billy's record yet. <laughs> I found out Billy, by the way, Billy, <clears throat> excuse me, and Tiffany had put out Moni Moni and I think we're alone now at exactly the same time. Yeah. That had never happened before. And they both went number one, back to back uh, in 1987. But I had not, when I first heard those, uh, the filthy lyrics, um, I had not heard Billy's record yet. And I thought I was getting booed off stage. I thought they were talking to me. And, and so, <laughs> Uh, I realized that this that came that was invented by the way at spring break of, of 1987 and um, I, I can't take credit for those words I didn't write those words so you know I didn't get publishing on it which really upset me. <laughs> but at, at any rate um, yeah that was that was something very peculiar to Billy's version of Moni Moni. And, but I, I got, got to tell you, he made a hell of a record because he kept the hard edges on it. And he probably did it the way we would have done it if we did it in the eighties instead of the sixties. <clears throat> um, you know, you know, the, the crunch chords, the uh, power chords and all of the, the fluff he put into it really was, uh, spectacular and it really made the record and uh i told him so uh we we were together on mtv uh doing an interview and i told him 
uh, how how much I liked the record. Tiffany too. I ran into her, and you know the funny part was, uh, I told her I said you know she she actually apologized to me for her, the way she did the record. I said, are you kidding? You went number one. We we only went number two. <laughs> That's a true story. She went up. She got higher on the charts than we did uh, with the same song. So anyway, I was. Uh, very, and I'm, I, I must tell you, I'm always very flattered and very honored uh, when I hear other artists doing my songs. Uh, you, you know, I love hearing how other people interpret your music. And uh, we've had over 300 major covers uh, of our stuff from Dolly Parton to Prince, the REM to the Boston Pops Orchestra. Um, uh, doing our stuff, and so I'm I'm very honored and and very flattered. There's a video on YouTube uh, from a few years back of you and Joan Jett doing Crimson and Clover together, and it's phenomenal. Absolutely well, love you. that video. We did that the night that she uh, was inducted, yeah, into the uh, Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joan. And Miley Cyrus was on my other side. And the, the three of us did Crimson and Clover. It was kind of cool. Dave Grohl uh, was uh, uh, playing uh, playing guitar. And he, you know, he sang a verse. And so there were literally three generations of rock and rollers uh, singing uh, Crimson and Clover at the same time. And it really was, uh, as I said, a great honor and uh, a thrill. Uh, to meet all these people and to and to work with them. Tommy, in addition to being a hit songwriter, you also, in 2010, wrote a book called Me, the Mob, and the Music. What inspired you to finally write that book? Well, for years, people have been on me to uh, write down, to do a memoir. And um, we originally were going to call the book Crimson and Clover. And we were originally going to write about, you know, the hits and write about making records. And it would have been an interesting book. <laughs> Excuse me. But we got about a third of the way into it. My co-writer, Martin Fitzpatrick, and I got about a third of the way into it and realized that if we don't tell the roulette story, we're really cheating ourselves and everybody else because that really is the story. Mm -hmm. And I was a little nervous about writing uh, in detail the roulette story because some of these guys were still walking around. And, uh, you know, you never know. And so we kind of waited until the last of the roulette regulars, as I call them, uh, passed away. So uh, I felt like I could comfortably write about, I could tell the truth about what actually happened. So I, that's what happened. We, I, we waited till we felt comfortable writing the whole story, and then we started writing the story. And Martin came up with the, uh, with the title, which I thought was really brilliant you know i think he he had told me that he's the night before he had watched an old movie me and the, mom and the music it was a song uh that was that had stuck in his head and so he just changed the word to mob or you and the night and the music was was the song you and the night and the music and so he, so he changed the words around a little bit and it came out, me, the mob and the music. I said, that's great. That's great. You couldn't come up with a more commercial title than that. And uh, so that's what we decided to call it. But as soon as we were finished with the book, uh, we, we started getting uh, uh, sounded on by uh, Broadway people, uh, movie people, um, and just right out of the box. And so uh, we were very, very happy about that. Uh, it's going to be a movie. 
And it's taken a long time because we had COVID and then we had the writer's strike and everything. You know, Hollywood is back up and running now. So uh, Barbara Dufina is producing the movie, who produced Goodfellas, uh, uh, Casino with Martin Scorsese, Hugo with Martin Scorsese. Um, uh, oh, going all the way back to the 80s, so The Color of Money with Paul Newman, and just a string of big hits. And she's going to be producing this. And um, uh, Kathleen Marshall is going to be directing. And uh, uh, she's a terrific director. And Matthew Stone did the screenplay. Uh, which I love. I love the screenplay. And so uh, it's all coming together now. They're in the casting phase right now. And uh, they've got their money ready. And, and so we're ready to go. I, uh, I'm, again, very honored and flattered that uh, uh, she thinks that uh, our story is important enough to be a film. Um, we're probably looking at another 18 months, two years. That's real time. That's how long it takes to put a, a film together. It's just amazing. All the moving parts are just unbelievable. I'm going to be co-producing and I'm going to, uh, of course, have to make sure that all the, the equipment that's in the studio, one of the hardest things is to make sure that all the equipment in the scenes of like putting Crimson and Clover together and things like that. Uh, is accurate for the time because you'll get some nerd who you know knows everything and he'll say, "Oh, that piece of equipment wasn't available till 1982." You know, so we have to be very careful to be accurate. But uh, the cast of characters are are amazing. Roulette had such an amazing group of people that were so interesting. Morris himself was the most fascinating person I ever met in my life. Uh, uh, this, you know, it's a story of this 18 year old kid from the Midwest hooking up with this uh, mobster from New York uh, and making it work. It really is quite a story and uh, uh, you can't beat rock and roll and the mob uh, <laughs> uh, together, you know, you can't beat it as a story. So anyway, I hope everybody likes it. No, Tommy, I'm, I'm sure they will for sure. And I look forward to, you know, when the movie comes out and we'll, we'll be there on the opening night, you know, for the premiere. Now, what, one other thing I'm wondering is, though, in addition to working on the movie, what else do you have on tap for the rest of this year and going into next year musically? Well, as you know, I, uh, I have a show every week on Sirius XM. Uh, on 60s Gold, Channel 73, every Sunday. I'm on from 5 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And um, this is our seventh year. And it's really quite amazing. I, When they first came to me with the idea, I didn't know what to do. I was a little scared, to be honest with you, because... Uh, as much radio as I've done, I've never done that side of the microphone before. Mm. And uh, so I didn't know what it was going to be like. And by the end of the first show, I was loving it. I, I, they, they want me to, to the, well, they, I divided the show up into sets. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm speaking 18 different times uh, during the show. And uh, playing records that were hits, but records that also should have been hits mm -hmm. and weren't because uh, the philosophy of our show basically is that the 1960s was so full of music, so much of it there was no room for on the charts and uh, no room for on radio, even by well-known artists. So... Uh, I get to play, they said, I want you to play, they told me to play anything I wanted. So I said, wow, that's a lot of, that's a lot of power right there. I don't know. They want me to play my music too. I said, can I go to jail for that? <laughs> no, we're satellite radio. They have to catch you first. <laughs> so, uh, 
At any rate, so uh, I, I love doing the show. And if anybody wants to tune in, it's every Sunday from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time on Channel 73, 60s Gold. And then we're touring all over the country. Um, you know, I've, I've taken about, oh, probably about 40 major dates this year, con uh, major uh, concerts this year, all over the United States and uh, all over North America, actually. And yeah, I saw so, you're coming so, uh, back. Tell me, I saw you're coming back to Pennsylvania in December. I think the Lansdowne Theater I saw on your website. So I, I think I know a couple of people that might be there. Well, well good. Don't Tommy, be strangers I, either. I no, so that. you know we're uh, as long as I can stay healthy and as long as uh, the crowds keep coming, we'll keep doing it. Tommy, I love that when we were hanging with you in the green room before your show in Lancaster, I remember asking you, do you do any warm-ups? What do you do before you walk on stage? And do you remember what you said? No. What did I you say? You said, well, sometimes I clear my throat. <laughs> <laughs> I yell at Ira. <laughs> but uh, at any rate... Um, I, I, I've been blessed with a voice and uh, that I can, uh, that usually I can crank out at the drop of a hat. I hope it stays that way. Um, uh, but I've been very, very blessed and fortunate, uh, to be able to do it this long. Uh, if in 1964, when I recorded Hanky Panky, you had told me that I'd be singing this song in 2024, I just said, right, right, right. I, I would have never, there's no way, there's no way that I, I would have uh, believed that 60 years later, uh, I'd be singing the same song uh, and they'd still be uh, yelling for it, so. Yeah, and, and Tommy, I have to tell you, um, in addition to singing the same song for 60 years, and this is the God's honest truth, when Rosie and I walked out of the American Music Theater that night, I think between the two of us, we just said the word wow 10 or 15 times. I mean, you blew the roof off of that place, and I just well, was blown you. away. And that's why I want to come back and see and hear it again. And wow works backwards, too. Don't forget <laughs> that. Thank yes, you very much. Does. Thanks for the compliment. Well, Tommy, my goodness, this has been really an honor. You are a music icon. And I know that you you are very grounded, very down to earth. I, you know, I, Bill and I, when we when we were invited into the green room, we felt like we were interrupting something. And you were like, come on in and have a seat. And you were just chatting with us. It was yeah, I remember. Just so wonderful. And I think that's people sense that. And in addition to the immense talent that you have, I think they see through to the inside of Tommy James. And uh, we want to say thank you for that as well. Well, bless your heart. Thank you so much for your yes. kind words. I appreciate it. And we wish you continued success and, and great health and that your voice keeps as powerful as ever as you continue performing and bringing joy to the masses. And thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's been great talking to you. You as Bye -bye. well. And folks, thank you as always for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed the show as much as we have. We'll see you next week. Thank you. And watch how you play They don't understand So we're running as fast as we can Holding on to each other's hands Trying to get away
episode has been brought to you by Doherty and Company Insurance Services for all your business and personal insurance needs. Our friends at Tennis Addiction in Exton, PA and the Malin Agency, where exceeding expectations is how they do business.